Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. All right, welcome back to another edition of the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, your official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans. It is day three of training camp in Nashville. Two a days done with just one practice today on Thursday, tomorrow day off. Now the practice on Saturday, Sunday before the team flies back in and boom, we are in the preseason opener back at the Smoothie King Center as the Pelicans take on. Todd Graffinini, voice of the Pels. The Orlando Magic. There it is. You've been doing your homework already, looking at the lineup and things of that nature. Todd back with us again. Jim Ike and offer from NewOrleansPelicans.com. So we're going to have a, a little fun with this podcast today. We're going to kind of go over what we saw yesterday because we saw a lot. We saw sequences of, of late game situations, Todd. Jim, we also saw a variety of different lineups, which is what Willie Green has been saying and it was a very competitive evening as well. So we'll touch on that in the first part of this podcast and kind of go over what we see in today's practice here as well. But I guess we just start with, look, we, we've been wanting to see what this team was going to sort of look like in competitive situations. And Todd, the first thing that stood out to me when they started the afternoon or the evening practice after doing drills, they go at it here, blue versus gray, blues, you know, Different lineups that we're going to be seeing, but Brandon Ingram, yep. DeJounte Murray, first, I guess, competitive drill where they were trying to get to, what, 10 points or 13 points or whatever. I mean, it was B.I. and it was DeJounte. Yeah, no, it, it, we were kind of joking after it was over because they're wearing the blue jerseys and the opponent, whoever might be that grouping is wearing the gray jerseys and then there's another group that's wearing the red jerseys. So this one was blue versus gray and we were saying after it was over because the blue won easily and that's what you would say would be the front line mm -hmm. guys on these rotations that that was the Brandon Ingram game because he basically took it over. He had two threes, including the one that closed it out and got him to the 13 points. But we also saw DeJounte Murray doing DJ things, uh, getting a steal, and then driving the lane and basically breaking the ankles <laughs> right. of Jamal Kane, getting into that paint, kicking it out to Brandon Ingram for the wide-open three, which he made. And that is some of the things, Jim, that I know – that's going to get Pelicans fans very, very excited. Yeah, it's fun watching DeJounte with his ability to get into the paint. I mean, he, he just has these really long strides. I'm sure for people that have watched him throughout his career, this is nothing new. But um, I think that's definitely an emphasis that the team is, is going to have this year, too, is to try to get to the basket as much as possible. We love the threes, um, but, you know, layups are, and dunks are better than that, especially when you're talking to Gus. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, a lot, of times the, <laughs> a lot of times the penetration that DeJounte does – uh, um, opens up the wide open threes because all of a sudden a bunch of guys are pulled in defensively trying to help and now and then you got all these guys spotting up for open shots. But yeah, it's it's interesting to see just some of the different combinations that they're using. I mean, there's a countless number of things that they can go with. There's small lineups. There's maybe some bigger lineups. There's probably lineups, especially when you get into some of the depth that the Pelicans have at the wing, where you could probably put like five wings on the court all at the same time and still have a lot of ball handling and have a ton of switchability. I know defensively that's something that they've talked about is that there's a lot of lineups where they can switch one through four, maybe even one through five in some cases. So, yeah, it's it's going to take a lot of work, though, I think, through training camp and preseason to sort out some of the possibilities and figure out what is the what are the best combinations here. I think one of the things, though, that you don't see that, that takes work, and I go back to the Jante Murray's uh, uh, introductory press conference ties. He goes, no, it's not going to take work. I know exactly what to sort of do. We saw that. We, we've seen that the entire time here in Nashville. In between drills, during drills, he's pulling players aside. He's kind of telling them where to go. And, and the thing that you either can do or, or can't in that first session there was, well, you know, Daniel Tice is driving down the lane. Right. DeJounte's driving. Uh -huh. Defense comes to him. Simple low-look dish for a dunk. I mean, that th those are things that if you know how to play the game, the pick and roll is going to be there. The driving dish is going to be there. The driving kick for the three is going to be there. That's just – it's such a natural thing for him that it's just going to 
kind of take getting used to who they are, but that guy can do that. We saw that immediately. No, and the thing about Murray is he just he's such a threat on both sides of the court. And we talked about the steals and the deflection yesterday, but you know, a couple days ago when you're listening to him speak, you're thinking, well, this guy could actually make a run at it and lead, leading the league in assists. Mm. And, yeah. I mean, that's one thing, but you know he can score the basketball as well, Jim. He had three 40-point mm. games last year uh, with, a, with a high of 44. So he can put the ball in the basket. He can find the open man, which I, I think we've seen a lot of uh, in the first couple of days of this training camp. He wants to make... His opponent, uh, his opponents, his teammates better and make their jobs easier, as he has already said on the record. So, and he's going to have countless opportunities to do so. He had a bunch of games last season where he basically just took over, especially right. during the stretch when Trey Young was right. injured and the Hawks really didn't drop off a lot without Trey Young. It was one of those examples of, you know, where, you know, he, you give him a bigger responsibility and he can totally handle it. Right. He had a game against I think it was Boston where they had a huge comeback that was a, that and he was just the game. had that was a bunch game. of clutch he baskets. Had 44 in that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean that part of it is big but um I think like you guys referenced I think sometimes when people talk about the center position for the Pelicans and they're you know concerned or, or they're wondering like what what contributions these guys are going to make. I think a bunch of them are are the centers are already seeing in in training camp that if you're in the right spot you're going to get a nice dish off for a layup and a dunk. We've seen Tice do that a bunch of times where, you know, and this is something Antonio Daniels mentioned in the video updates that he and Joel Myers have been doing that. It's, it's about being opportunistic. If yep. you're in the, those position, if you're in that position, um, be in the right spot, cut at the right time. And I think when you're playing with some of the, you're, a lot of these guys are going to be playing with four other proven decorated NBA scorers. And they're going to be, the player that maybe the other team is is paying a little bit less attention to, that's when you just cut right to the front of the rim and you end up with a dunk. There's a basketball term you keep referencing, triple-double. You keep saying that, and I think we're going to see a couple of those. Look, one of the areas the Pels struggled last year, late-game situations, closing things out. So what, four minutes in is kind of clutch time? It's five minutes, right? five minutes or less, five-point game either way. That's, right. well, that, yep. that starts the clutch game. So last night, Head coach Willie Green says, let's do a couple of, um, you know, periods here. Uh, four minutes on the clock, game tied. Right. Let's see what happens uh, on some of those. They did that later when it was just 48 seconds game tied. But the this these three periods, no score, got to get to 13, right, I think is what it was. And four minutes to play. Different lineups. He said we're going to see different lineups. So we saw different groups on there. The thing that stood out to me, there were three periods. Two periods, DeJounte Murray on the floor. One period, no. What did we see with the period without? Well, unfortunately, I got into a DeLorean and went back to some of the clutch situations that we had last year where we were not able to close it out. And, Gus, we were standing right next to each it other. It was 10-2. Two. 10-2, two, the blue team mm -hmm. had the lead in a cl you know, with, with the time going down. And we're looking down there, and I'm thinking to myself, and then I mentioned to you, there's no true ball handler because Jose Alvarado was on the other side. And he so was amped up. He was pretty he was, amped up. Was, so, again, that would have been your ball handler right. in that situation. But he was on the gray team. So there's no ball handler. And I'm thinking to myself, uh-oh, this could be trouble. And sure enough, the very first the very first possession going down was a shot clock violation. They did not get a shot up. And then the comeback was on. And... The great team. It was an 8-0 run. It was an 8-0 yeah. run in a blink, in the yeah. blink of an eye. Two overtime. Blue did win, but that, to your Correct. point, it, that they, was the thing. And, and we talked about it. said, like, this is why you get DeJounte Murray. I mean, it was it was basically out there for everybody to see. And, you know, he but he was not participating right. during that particular drill. You had to see if anybody else was going to step up. But that, that was an issue, and we talked about it constantly. But that's why you got that guy. I'm not going to panic uh, uh, about the second day of training camp. Hey, that's that's the, the, I'm not going to get I'm not going to get stressed out. <laughs> but but no, this I mean the I think impact he has though. Yeah, I think yeah. It, it is interesting to see, you know, teams try to run through situations. I I love watching, you know, you condense the game down to the end and you see some of the situations that come up. You 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 know, during the regular season you wonder like how do how are teams prepared for, 
you know, okay, you're down by one and there's 35 seconds on the game clock, 24 on the shot clock. You go for two for a two for one. Do you hold the ball? It's just, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting just to watch teams kind of go through all these situations and you try to learn as much as you can from going through all kinds of scenarios at the end of games. And that's what training camp and preseason are for. No doubt. And, and to Jim's point, Todd, what we saw, the final two periods of practice, 48 seconds on the clock, 97, 97 each team. And it was exactly what Jim just said to work on, inbounding the basketball, yep. late game free throws, yep. um, screening things off, getting rebounds, things that we – like those are the things with 48 seconds to go. It's a possession or two and, and, and little things like inbounding the ball or backing, you know, the defensive player way to get that rebound and not getting a put back, which Gray got mm -hmm. on one of those. That That's one of the things that that's what you work on right now. No, absolutely. Uh, this is what training camp this and, and it, it's good because you can physically work on these situations time on the clock and and that's what a head coach and the assistants they're looking at the film after that session was over last night it's like all right this is what we need to work on this is this is what is positive this is what was negative and and you can mix and match you can uh add a, a player to like maybe we'll see something different today uh going into it so it, it's it's all trial and error right now nothing counts but you're putting things on tape for the coaches. Quick side note, too. I think it's interesting that inbounding the ball is so much more important and significant than it used to be because if you go back maybe, I, I forget how many years it was, eight, ten years ago, they drastically cut down how many timeouts you get at the end of the game. So at the three-minute mark, you only have two timeouts maximum. It used to be you could go into the last couple minutes with four timeouts. So you had a lot of margin for error. Like, okay, we can't get the ball inbounds. No big deal. We'll just call a timeout. Point. But now it's just so much more important that you know exactly what you're going to do in every situation to get in the ball and bounce. And I think the one thing as we close up, just the recap from the evening portion of practice yesterday is with all those different lineups and what we saw, there are a lot of options. And, and, and the three balls are going to be there. The driving kicks are going to be there. I think it's going to be exciting for fans here in a couple of days to get their first look at it. There are options on this team. Uh, I, I think, and I, I would uh, – guess that you would agree with me. I mean, th there really is an emphasis on shooting a three, at least very, very early in this mm -hmm. camp. And we talked about Matt Ryan wearing the blue mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. And how about Jordan Hawkins last night? Uh, I mean, he was spectacular. Yeah. Um, coming off the curl, catch and shoot threes from the wing. You know, I went over to Antonio. Da I went over to Antonio Daniels a couple of times and he was just shaking his head in a very good way because <laughs> right. like, yeah. that kid can yeah. flat out shoot. And to your point, yesterday, oh my, B.I. I mean, he keeps knocking down threes, and he looks good, and he's he, still driving he, and doing he those took a couple. Too. He took a couple of mid-ranges last yeah. night. Those were the first two that we saw. But again, most, most of his shots are coming from the perimeter, but we also saw the patented drive to the, drive to the rim and uh, king finger roll. Oh, he did it. Yeah, I mean... Jordan Hawkins, I love watching his quick release. I yep. mean, he gets the ball off so, so fast. It's, yep. he, the ball's barely in his hands, and he's already off the floor and firing. So, yeah, I think during preseason maybe we'll keep track of – we'll keep a close eye on how many threes they take in each game. I know you guys mentioned yesterday the 40 number as, as a goal. Maybe that'll be something that – can be emphasized in at least in preseason and see if that that's something that becomes a habit all right we don't want to miss the bus so we want to get down over to belmont and we'll check out what takes place in the you know next portion of practice here on the pelicans podcast all right practice is in the books for thursday afternoon todd and jim going to get your quick thoughts as to what we saw i think we're in agreement you and me todd Jose Alvarado stood out today. No doubt about it. And just the competition, the intensity. I mean, it almost felt like a regular season game out there, the way the two teams were going at it. But just Jose has looked so comfortable and so confident. You know, he's got the contract behind him, and he's got now stability and security in the league. But it hasn't affected his attitude. He's the same Jose, but he just looks like a different player. And quite honestly, Gus, he should be because it's his fourth year in the league now, and he's a seasoned vet who's played many meaningful games for this team, but he looks like it right now in training camp. All right, you're going to head downstairs, do a little TV stuff. You'll get to see more of Graf along with Andrew Lopez and our television report coming up here as well. 
Uh, Jim Eichenhoff, for your thoughts, man, what stood out to you? Again, for me, it was Jose Alvarado, look confident, kind of like what Todd just said. You also just saw, I, I, I get the sense, like, He's a leader on this team. Like, that side of the ball he takes serious. You know, they, they're wearing the gray jerseys, or they call them white, however they want to look yes. at it. But he's there to win. He's there to compete. He's jawing at Willie Green. He wants free throws. He he wants to win every single time. And then when they played a couple of five-minute quarter sessions, he had pretty much all but one bucket in a game, uh, in, in a quarter session, which means he dominated. You use the right word when you say he wants to win. He's such a winning player. I mean, if we look at the, the numbers last year of the Pelicans' record when he played versus in the games that he missed, it was a drastic difference. I'm really excited about this point guard combination that the Pelicans have between he and DeJounte Murray. They were going through a lot of end-of-game situations where it's like tie game, two minutes, how do you execute? One of the stats that I mentioned maybe earlier in the offseason, maybe more wrote about this, not necessarily on the podcast, was the Pelicans scored 203 clutch points as a team last season. DeJounte Murray had 103 by himself. So basically, or 106. So he had almost half, he had more than half of the points in clutch time that the Pelicans had as a team overall, just to kind of give you an indication. Now, it's not apples and apples to apples because... The minutes, the amount of minutes is different, but still, I mean, that's pretty interesting, incredible how productive he was last year in the clutch. It's interesting you bring up clutch because it's been apparent since we've been here in Nashville and they have an off day tomorrow, but every day after practice, they're working on it from different aspects of it. Layups, three-point shots, then time situations. We saw that yesterday in the evening one, right? 48 seconds on the clock, two minutes on the clock, and they emphasize that here again today. And it look, and you can see why they do it. It's it's hard. You have to get the inbounds in. You have to finish the shots. Eve Misi could have won the game in the scrimmage to the end here. Jose with a beautiful drive, but she didn't miss. One um, pair of starters missing one of the front end of a back-to-back, you know, for free throws. Just things of that nature that all add up. Zion and B.I., one for two from the line late. Just things of that nature. This is why you work on it now because it, it does – come into effect in the regular season yeah I mean a lot of it is all about execution and I guess if you want to look at it in one good way if you want to be glass half full if you look at the talent that they have and and you go back to last season and go through a bunch of different categories we looked at you know offensive efficiency turnover rate three-point percentage it's incredible how much of a difference there was between the way the Pelicans performed in those last five minutes of close games and the way they did overall so in some ways, I feel like there's nowhere to, to go but up. There's, I, don't, I don't see any way that they'll perform as, as poorly as, and have as many struggles as they did in clutch time. But, I mean, that's something that they're working on right now because we know in the Western Conference where from the beginning of the season you have to be on top of your game. And um, you're going to have so many close games in the West because there's so many good teams. So that part of it is huge, and, and hopefully they can make a big jump there. Well, fans are going to see soon enough here with the first preseason game some of the different lineups and availabilities that Willie Green has to go to lineup-wise. But, look, you and Ty were just kind of having a little fun little session of just how deep this team sort of is. I mean, you you can legit throw five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten guys on this court and feel comfortable with, like, to the point where, like, I'm comfortable with Jose running the show. I'm comfortable with CJ running, you know, Brandon running. I mean, like, you legit, we haven't even got to a lot of the players that, you know, are going to see minutes for this team. Yeah, I mean, I feel like to some, we see this to some degree every season, but I definitely think you could be in a situation this year where there's fans that say, we got to get this guy on the court. I don't understand why he's not playing. And you're like, well, he's the 13th man, the 14th man. Um, they're deep. You're, you're going to have that, that situation where, Again, there's going to be a lot of difficult decisions that have to be made as far as you have multiple guys that can fill a role and you're going to have to pick one of them. Um, There's only so many minutes to go around and and you already have six guys at the top of this roster that you think are going to play somewhere in the neighborhood or way over 30 minutes. So eventually you start to run out of of time. Um, I don't want to get too complicated with the math, but there's 48 minutes a game. There's five players. That's 240 total minutes. So... You have three guys that play, or six guys that play 30 minutes, that's 180. That leaves 60 for everyone else. So you can see how how fast it is where you're like, there's not a lot of extra time to go around. So it's going to be a difficult decision to narrow it down. But 
I'm sure we'll get into this more when we talk more specifically about the preseason game on Monday. It's going to be really fun to watch to see how they decide the lineups and what we see as far as minutes. And I mean, there I would think, too, there's going to be some cases where there's guys that maybe don't play at all in the first preseason game and then play 20 minutes in the second preseason game and vice versa. But difficult decisions that the coaches are going to have to make. The Pelicans podcast, not only do you get the latest Pels information, but also a advanced mathematics a math. class. A lot of math. Yep. I'm terrible at math. Uh, one final thing before I wrap up here, man, in my time in Nashville, uh, something else that stood out to me at practice, Jose Alvarado, I think was the story today. But Zion Williamson's a close, you know, second, I would say 1A to 1B. And I say that, Jim, not because he hasn't had any good practices, but today really looked like the Z towards the end of last season. As Graf would say, he had that, that stroll, that tiger stroll. That bounce. Yes, yeah. that bounce where you can kind of see it. He yeah. was eager to get possessions going he was quick to the basket he saw him finishing in the glass he saw him playing defense hands on the ball and there was one thing in particular where I don't know if it was a block shot or a miss shot and he was going up against Greg Monroe and it went out of bounds and he started jawing and he's been jawing a lot by the way for people that haven't been able to see these practices and he's pointing to DeJounte Murray at the top of the key come on inbound it inbound it yeah. uh, Corey Brewer is talking to him and he goes come on Give like he wanted the ball and what does DeJounte Murray and Zion do? They do a pick and roll. Zion goes right down the lane and scores, and he starts to talk. But I love that. I just wanted to present that to fans listening. There's a different look in Zion's eyes and in his body language and in his play this training camp than the previous ones. Am I wrong on that? No, you're right. I mean, imagine if just with DeJounte's presence, you're talking about maybe three, four, easy baskets per game more that Zion got than he had in the past. He's already a guy that averages, you know, maybe around 25 points a game. Maybe he can up that even more. But um, that's one of the things I noticed too is, and people are going to watch this in preseason games, is just the way that DeJounte and Zion play off of each other, some of the pick and rolls that they can put together, the fact that DeJounte always has his head up and he's always looking for him. So, I mean, that's going to be so much fun to see those two guys combine on a lot of the plays in the in the half court off on the offensive end. Yeah, no doubt. Will you, sir, try to behave yourself? You have a day off tomorrow, which means tonight and tomorrow, Broadway. Oh, look out. Oh, I mean, look, I'll tell you what. Alabama is in town to take on Vanderbilt over the weekend. I don't know who's going to be wilder, the Alabama fan base or you. Probably me, but uh, we'll have to see. We'll, we'll see what I can what I can come up with this weekend. And we'll I still have to work though, so I'm gonna have to keep it somewhat under control. But you know me, man. It's anything could happen this weekend. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we're still gonna have another podcast from Nashville. You and Todd will join me on Saturday to help Russ Preley preview the preseason opener against the Magic will be on Monday. So next time I see you, sir, we'll be in New Orleans. The next time the New Orleans Pelicans podcast will come your way will be tomorrow as you will hear our conversation with Andrew Lopez, newest member to New Orleans Pelicans team. Looking forward to having him on throughout the rest of the year here as well. So as always, appreciate you for tuning us in. That'll do it for this Thursday edition, day four of New Orleans Pelicans training camp. I'm Gus Cattengill's Jim Mike and Offer. We'll see you next time on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.